Welcome back to Researcher on a Mission, ROAM Radio. That is me, Dr. J. And as usual, we have an incredible show for you today, but a more special show because today we're speaking on a topic that has yet to be touched on on this show. And and we're speaking with someone who not only knows the ins and outs of what we're going to be speaking about, who, someone who got an exclusive interview by a colonel who worked at this infamous base, and that base is Dulce. I'm sure many of you out there heard about Dulce. It's got several levels, and the lowest levels are occupied by extraterrestrials, and the higher levels are occupied by not only U.S. military, but also other extraterrestrials. And of course, there's a famous fight that happened in 1979. You'll hear so much about this. It's all from this book, UFO Highway. Let me give you a little background real quick. Talk about synchronicity. When I was in the midst of wrapping this book up, and I was seeing Linda Moulton Howe back in August at Contact in the Desert. She actually publicly stated that this is a must read. So anybody who was there at that event knows exactly what I'm talking about and knows exactly what we're going to be speaking about. And without further ado, let's bring in researcher, author, and also creator of apps, specifically this really incredible app, uh, Hunting Ghosts, called the Ghost Hunter app. And that is Mr. Anthony Sanchez. Anthony, welcome to the show. Hey, Dr. J. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it is truly a pleasure. Your book was more than a joy to read. And I guess we might as well start with what I, when I really got trapped in the book, and that was the <clears throat> 1940s Muroc Expedition. And for those people out there, if Muroc doesn't sound too familiar, Edwards Air Force Base, that's what Muroc used to be called prior to it being renamed by a pilot that crashed there. So 1940, we are looking for a place for the atomic bomb. I'll let you finish the story, Mr. Sanchez. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we're looking for a place for our atomic development program at that time, and there were various teams that were scouring the entire southwest of the United States, um, specifically Nevada, New Mexico, uh, even areas of California, Arizona, and uh, I want to say Utah as well. So one specific team, which was operating out of what is now known as Edwards Air Force Base, at the time it was called Murak Army Airfield, they actually were in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, and they happened upon a, an area called the Archuleta Mesa, uh, which is east of Mount Archuleta, and they found this massive cavern uh, which held this amazing find. And then this group was known as the Murak Expedition, and it's, it's a bit involved, you know, with regards to the level of detail that they came across, but it's super important because that time uh, in our technological evolution uh, signified a major jump. This is where we saw exponential leaps and bounds in technology uh, many of you are, are familiar with Lieutenant Colonel Phil Corso, who uh, stated that you know he had worked for um, the military and essentially was sort of a liaison between a uh, a specific group that was uh, part of the military industrial complex who was uh, being fed information and technology and physical pieces of technology for the purposes of reverse engineering and um, that's what this, this, all of this has to deal with. Uh, to, everything in this book, with regards to the Dulce interview, is essentially um, based around those, those facts and, 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 and a lot more that tell the story of the, of the Dulce, um, of the Murak expedition and the Dulce discovery. Well, let's continue with what happened in the 40s because they go into this cavern, right? They, they discover... Right. 
untouched equipment that's very unfamiliar. It's under cobwebs. It's under dust. Then they go a little further, and then they discover skeletons, right? And mm -hmm. these skeletons were Indians, and, and they thought that they dated them to be from the 1800s, Apache warriors. But then they realized that it had to have been post-Civil War because there were also some uh, cowboy skeletons there, and there was Remington uh, Re Remington rifle repeaters or Winchester repeaters as well as Colt rifles, right? right. Or Colt pistols. And that's when they realized it wasn't the early 1800s. It had to have been the, the late 1800s. But yet it still wasn't touched for decades because of the amount of dust and cobwebs. That's right. right. There was a, a treasure trove of physical evidence. Um, the physical evidence pointed to some sort of a battle between um, the Apache Indians um, and and by the way, this this would have been um, this this would have been something incredible for these these uh, Native Americans to have come across. Um, but w my understanding from um, interviews that I have conducted with people of the Hikapuri Apache Nation right there in Dulce, New Mexico, elders and um, and uh, people who even work in law enforcement to this day who are members of the tribe. Um, one of the one of the funniest things that that I, I come across is that these people, you know, don't outwardly, you know, talk about their histories um, with with just anyone. For instance, Governor Jesse Ventura went up there, and you know, he's pretty big. He's pretty big personality. I mean, in both in politics and in entertainment, and uh, they wouldn't allow him onto the reservation to film. Um, you know, they were welcoming, welcoming and very friendly and cordial, and they were excited to see them. But with regards to filming on the reservation and asking questions about the purported Dulce base, uh, that just didn't happen. And when you looked at the TV show that uh, ultimately aired later on, um, you find that where they actually filmed, they were, where, they, where they were seen, it was Dulce. It wasn't Dulce. They were actually in the town of Lumberton. I know because I've been there, and several people from the, uh, several of my friends from the area also confirmed it because I was curious. I'm like, that looks more like Lumberton, which is east of Dulce, uh, 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 well east of the uh, eastern slope of the Archuleta Mesa. And, and the, the point is, is that they just don't openly talk to anybody about it unless they're asked. And I was one of the few researchers that actually asked questions. But I didn't just blindly go in and start asking questions. One of the first things that I did was I read all 52 of the, uh, of the sacred texts of the Hickory Apache to understand their culture, and that's number one. And number two, to see if there was anything in the sacred text that alluded to the fact that there may be some sort of being that is not human that lives there. And lo and behold, there were stories in the sacred texts in the, in the sacred texts of the Korea that not only alluded to the Dulce beings, but also spoke of the ant people that the Hopi Indians also uh, mentioned in their sacred texts and their, uh, their oral histories. So that was huge for me. That was like a major, major thing for me when I was piecing all of this information that I was receiving together because they had to make sense. There had to be some type of correlating evidence and there it was, right there in front of me. And so that lends uh, more, you know, uh, credibility and justification to the information that was being supplied with regards to the event. One thing I, I love, well, first of all, American Indians in general, most tribes have some stories or, or something involved where they're talking about getting wisdom from people from the stars and so on and so forth. They're very receptive to this. And the right. fact that you went as far as reading their sacred texts, you connected with them, something that most people don't do. And that, right. to them, showed respect. And I think that's more uh, – that all combined, everything that you said and, and the fact that they respected you for actually reading their sacred texts, and that's probably what gave you more access to that. And one thing I also love in the story as well is when the U.S. military arrived, wasn't one of the people there from the Hickory uh, tribe, one of the chiefs or, or – the... Are you, are you talking about in the 70s or back in the 40s? Both, if I'm not mistaken, or was it just the 70s? Uh, well, in the 70s, there were two two individuals. There was one from the Hickory Apache Police Department, 
and then that's the tribal police, and there was somebody from the New Mexico State Police. And I know their names. I have their names now. It's been confirmed to me. But I don't want to put that, put them out on, you know, uh, in the public uh, because uh, there's some families involved and stuff like that. But but it's been confirmed. Nori Hanakawa, Edmund Gomez, uh, even Gabe Valdez, uh, uh, the son of Gabe Valdez, uh, uh, Greg Valdez, who wrote a book that essentially uh, goes against everything that my book says. He, his book essentially um, – points towards the 100% to the, to the military uh, and, you know, uh, top secret, you know, projects that were being conducted by uh, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base and having nothing to do with aliens. It was a smoke screen. And I don't buy that. I don't believe that. You know, I, I respect the guy. You know, he has a, you know, a lot of evidence collected over the years by his father. But I just, I can't buy into that. As a matter of fact, most people don't know this, but Nori Ohayakawa, who, um, wrote the forward to my book, um, I, I haven't spoken to him in months. Uh, he kind of just dropped off the face of the planet, and uh, it wasn't until a few weeks ago when I first heard from him, he he himself is, is kind of stepping away from the whole story. I don't know if he's been gotten to by somebody, but uh, he's taking a different approach now. They've done a complete, you know, 180 from what, he originally espoused with regards to my book, my research, and uh, I still consider him a friend. You know, the differences of opinions and ideas doesn't end a friendship, but um, I'm telling you, this is a very, very touchy situation, a very, very touchy topic, and it does strange things to people. Uh, it, it definitely is, because not only do you have people that have disappeared for talking, you have people that uh, – the experiments that go on in, in the base, which we'll get to more. And one thing let me throw out to the listeners out there, Norio is, is very well known in ufology. Uh, I remember seeing him almost two decades ago talking mm-hmm. about Area 51. He's been on the scene for a long time. Uh, in, and nine, so, in 1995, um, Norio actually filmed, it might have been 94, 95, he filmed uh, a, um, a lecture that he gave on uh, on Area 51, Dreamland. And I forget the name of the documentary, I have it in the back of my head. But I actually owned the VHS tape. I bought it at the time that it came out. And when Norio and I met up back in 2009, 2010 for my book, UFO Highway, because, you see, I actually went to New Mexico uh, to visit Norio, and we went to his house. Uh, we, he and I drove all over the, the state of New Mexico, stayed at various uh, places, and then um, we did some research while we were there for uh, Janet Saylor's ASPE event. This is the, uh, an organization that she heads up, and uh, we were making initial contacts with people, letting them know about the interview, um, about the colonel. And Norio, yes, he's a big time, you know, guy with regards to all of this. But Norio actually signed the copy of the VHS tape that I have. For me, it's kind of like a piece of history. Uh, but yeah, but but again, some of the things that he spoke about in that VHS, uh, you know, in that that uh, presentation that he gave, you know, he's no longer even believing some of those things that he felt so strongly about. I mean, he's just done a complete change, and I. A lot of people have contacted me over the past six months, you know, saying, have you heard Norio on the radio recently? He completely is downplaying UFOs and saying this and that. You know, so I, mean, I tell them, Norio is my friend. Norio is, is an amazing investigator, an amazing researcher, a good person, and he has, a, he has a big heart, and I have nothing but respect for him. And, you know, any change of heart with regards to uh, my information or UFOs and aliens as a whole with respect to Dulcy, I don't care what he thinks because it's his opinion. We all have opinions. I'm sticking to what I know. I'm, I'm sticking to what was given to me. Um, I'm sticking to the information that has rocked the UFO community. Since the release of my book, UFO Highway, it has literally rocked the UFO community. It has been split in half. And there are so many people that have attacked me, have thrown me under the bus, have tried to debunk the information. They fail every time, by the way. And and then there's the, the other half that wholeheartedly embrace me and support me and understand that there's something going on here. Look, you mentioned the, the name Linda Moulton Howe. 
I received a call from Linda. I sent Linda the book in 2010. I sent her a signed copy just as a gesture because I mentioned her in the book. Um, and Norio actually approached her in 2010. See, because they live in the same town, essentially. And oh, Well, Rio Rancho is pretty close to Albuquerque. But he he approached her, and they're good friends. They, they've spoken at events and stuff, and she, she, she attends his events and vice versa. And she, she wouldn't have any of it because at the time there was some information with regards to the uh, VD-214, which is the, uh, the, uh, the military discharge papers, uh, there was a there was a bit of a, a, a brouhaha over it. You know, somebody was trying to take the document to a federally funded organization and expect that federally funded organization to look at the document and say, "Oh yes, Mr. UFO researcher, there are aliens in northern New Mexico working in collusion with the federal United States government and military industrial complex." No one's going to outright say say that, especially an organization that's funded by the federal government. So. There was just a whole bunch of stuff that went on. And uh, so besides all of that, you know, Linda, uh, four years later, contacts me and apologizes to me. And she's a beautiful person, a wonderful person. I've always respected her work. I mean, she's, a, she's an Emmy Award-winning journalist, you know, for the work that she did on A Strange Harvest, which is about the cattle mutilations. Uh, right there in the San Luis Valley, and even extending down into the northern New Mexico uh, area from uh, southern Colorado. So she calls me, apologizes to me, tells me that somebody who's worked at McDonnell Douglas for over 30-something years read the book and told her, you need to get a copy of the book. And he apologized to her. He said, I'm sorry, but the book is very difficult to obtain. Anthony has had difficulties getting the book out to people over the past three years. And there's a, there's a whole story behind that. You know, a bunch of books were stolen from me, and people have been selling them on eBay and on Amazon for hundreds of dollars. I mean, a copy of UFO Highway, just today I looked, was selling for 160 on eBay and 150 on Amazon. And this is ridiculous, because you can get it at my site for 20 bucks. But he apologized to her, because he didn't think he was going to be able to get her a copy. He told Linda, he said, Linda, I was going to send you a copy of the book, but I don't want to get, give away the copy that I have because it's so rare, and the copy that's on, uh, available on Amazon is for about $400. And she said, don't worry, I have a copy of Anthony's book in my library on the shelf. I'm looking at it right now. She goes, what's so important about it? And he detailed to her that the things that are mentioned in this book have rocked uh, the intelligence uh, circles and have made uh, headlines you know, across the UFO uh world because it's so important. He actually told her it's very dangerous information what he's putting out in this book. It's very serious. It's very dangerous. He goes, I implore you to read it. So so it was 72 hours later when she called me and told me this. And she had read the book. And next thing I know, uh, she and I are doing research together over the phone. We're correlating pieces of, uh, of evidence uh, from her circles uh, to my book with my source. And before you know it, we're on coast to coast talking about um, alien hybrids uh, for the second time in four years, because in three years, because in 2011, George Norrie had me on with, um, with uh, Bill Burns from UFO Magazine and UFO Hunters. And, and then uh, just this past summer, Linda Bolton Howe had me on again. And uh, of course, my portions were taped from a three hour interview that she and I did. But uh, her and George were able to hash out a bunch of information and then have an hour-long, you know, phone call uh, session with a bunch of people who were asking questions predominantly about the book. I think there was maybe two questions about the, about the, the starfish that were dying in the ocean or other segment. Everybody else was about Delcy. They wanted to know about the underground base. They wanted to know about the aliens. They wanted to know about the military-industrial complex. They wanted to know about Thomas Costello, who doesn't exist. Phil Schneider, who does exist or did exist, um, there was so much stuff that, the, that they wanted to cover. And again, all of it is because of this discovery that happened in the 40s, uh, this, uh, this joint effort of, of development on uh, various pieces of, uh, of technology that were being uh, not, so, not so much reverse engineered, but given to the military industrial complex through an exchange with these gray alien beings there at Dulcie. Think about it, Dr. J. 
1940, let's go back to 1930, we were still pretty much, you know, in these very, very rudimentary automobiles, early automobiles. Uh, just 20 years before that, uh, people were still riding the horse and buggy. Then all of a sudden, in the, in the mid-1940s, we see ex exponential leaps in uh, integrated circuitry designs, uh, fiber optics, uh, just like Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel For, uh, Phil Corso said. And, uh, and his, his information is validated by my source in the book. Yeah, Corso definitely in his book Day After Roswell, co-written by Bill Burns, who also hosts a show right here on this network. Mm -hmm. uh, he discussed all the different artifacts that and the different companies such as IBM, DuPont, uh, like you said, integrated circuit chips, uh, the advancement of lasers, uh, night vision, uh, Kevlar, so many things and fiber optics were right. were correlated to him. Now, let's, going back to 1940, the year 1940, when they were on the Muroc expedition. So they come into this cavern. They find these skeletons. They go a little further. They realize there's a battle. They find technology, screens that they can't acknowledge what they where they're powered from. Right. They're very thin. They have like a purple light glowing. And they get further and further into another level, a second level, if I'm not mistaken. And they start seeing eyes peeking around. Am I right? Well, you're, you're missing one point. You're, you're, when they found the skeletal remains of whoever it was that was fighting there, not only did they find human remains, but they also found skeletal remains of non-human entities that were closely, uh, you know, they thought they were maybe small people, deformed people. They didn't know what to make of it until they happened upon the technology. Then they started to put two and two together that those small humanoids may not have been uh, you know, humanoid at all, and something else entirely different. That's right. They actually thought they were children with big heads and giant eyes right. because the sockets right. were so big. Right. Now, there was there's a famous battle in 79, which we'll get to, but prior to that, same expedition in the 40s, when 1940, when they get further into the cavern, that's when they ultimately come face to face with the dissident greys, right? Right, right. Can, and can you tell... The, Go ahead. Right. So at that point, though, the dissident grays had, had it really separated off as a faction from the lower level grays. So you were seeing, well, they were seeing lower level grays and possibly dissident grays performing experiments at that point. Um, remember with the two soldiers, if you read the book, the two soldiers that went against their uh, their command's orders and, uh, and penetrated further into the tunnel, the, the structure, uh, they came across, you know, they came across, across grays, and ultimately they found a, a, a large lab, a low-lit lab, where there was actual work being done on captives. So... It's and that's what scared them to run back, essentially, right? It, exactly. Well, what scared them was when one of them actually dropped a gun, created a, you know, a loud enough sound to alert whoever it was that was in that lab, and they started being chased. And that chase is what I – mean, I'm not going to give away what happened at that moment. I don't, I don't want people to read it in the book. But the chase that ensued is what triggered that uh, initial uh, engagement, which was heavily – you know, uh, uh, involving uh, fire exchanges of fire. And one of the things that was found while they were exploring these caverns was uh, cuneiform, if I'm not mispronouncing that. Uh, and this resembled old Sumerian writing, but they realized that the writing was more advanced than what they found in ancient Sumer. Can you elaborate on that? Right. So one of the best things that could have happened was that the person that was in command was intelligent enough and educated enough to understand that what they had come across was of significant importance. So the tablets that they had found were metallic. First of all, they were, they were metal-based tablets. The big question that, that gets asked all the time was, if this was such an advanced group of uh, beings, why were they making these uh, etchings onto metal? Well, let's think about technology in its current form. Right now, I'm sitting in front of a computer that has hard drives. Uh, some of them are, are, are old analog-style drives. The other ones are now the newer so solid-state drives. It doesn't matter. These drives, within five to ten years, will, will begin to fail and will need to be replaced. 
the hard drive technology that we use, that you use. This goes for your flash drive technology. Everything is susceptible to electromagnetic uh, you know, uh, radiation, uh, power fluctuations. These things can get damaged. But when they came across these libraries that they found, and they found these thousands and thousands of sheets, these metallic sheets with uh, uh, computer-like precision with, with regards to the etchings, they were in pristine condition. And according to these things, these, these beams, they were going to remain that way for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So it makes more sense that that technology is, in fact, more advanced than the hard drive technology that we even have today. So let's say that the aliens had something equivalent to hard drives back then. They were smart enough to know that that technology was disposable, and they needed something that was going to last very long because this held the history of their people, the history of their religion, their origins. And uh, these were, uh, again, like you said, they had something resembling a Kenyan type cuneiform, which this, the commander realized, which is why they started calling in experts. This is why they started cordoning off the area and why essentially they uh, extracted everything from there, made its way over to Everett Airport Base, Murak Army Airfield at the time. Uh, and today it resides in um, uh, in Hangar 18 or something similar to Hangar 18 over in uh, Ohio. Right, Patterson. Right, Patterson Air Force Base. Yeah. Right. Now let's flash forward. Uh, okay, so they they found this this discovery. They they come across these beings in, in 1940. Then they retreat. Then they decide to build a, a permanent installation on level one. Right. right. And and then we. Fast forward to the 70s. What happened in 79, which ended up causing the colonel that you interviewed that had this exclusive interview that had such insight into this uh, this matter that you wrote this book on that so many people have come forward to authenticate it, and, and such, such as Linda Moulton Howe to say this is a must-read book. This what happened? What makes, right. This is what makes it so important. The short story, the short version is, there were federal contractors working there, um, a part of you know the establishment, you know the, facil the facility. The facility, by the way, is called the Rio Arriba uh, Scientific uh, Technological and Scientific uh, Underground Auxiliary. So, just for short, they call it Rio Ox, like Rio Auxiliary, Rio Ox. And in the DD-214, by the way, that facility was specifically mentioned. Um, this is the DD-214 of the Colonel. The the event that happened in 1979 had everything to do with contractors that were working there who understood the agreement between the lower level grades, the dissident grades, and the established contracting base. You had the Rand Corporation, you had IBM, uh, you had various uh, 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 contractors who were working under geological specifications. That's where Phil Schneider came in. And one of the things that they knew was that the the grades, not the dissident grades, because they didn't do any of this bad stuff. The lower level grades were not supposed to abduct humans, uh, work on humans, experiment on humans, and use them for purposes of subsidence. Well, they accidentally discovered that that was going on, and all hell broke loose when a couple of contractors who were close to the lower levels uh, saw this and and triggered a, a, a yet another engagement of a, of a, of a fire uh, fight that uh, lasted uh, for essentially roughly uh, 48 to 72 hours, and it was pretty bad. And Phil Schneider, a lot with 22 other people, were presumed dead or missing. As we later under, we, as we later learned, Phil Schneider was uh, he had left the facility. He snuck out of the facility, and in the, it was in the mid 90s when he went on, uh, you know, his, the lecture circuit started talking about this, started presenting physical geological samples from the, the Archuleta Mesa and Mount Archuleta synthesized materials from the grades that were used as part of our stealth technology. It wasn't long, too long after that that he ended up dead. And all of his papers, photos, and, and samples were missing. You have cash, a watch, a loaded gun, and a whole bunch of other things that you typically would expect to be stolen were all left behind. So 
and of course the the suicide the fake suicide I remember of Dulce of a uh, uh, Schneider it just couldn't have happened the way they said it did like that he wrapped a rubber cord around him when he only had one working hand uh, he was right. disabled and that's why I don't like Greg Valdez's book because Greg Valdez's book is purported to have all of this this uh, 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 this evidence this empirical evidence that you know absolutely proves uh, that. You know, this is how Phil Schneider really died, that his wife's story was being contradicted. Uh, but let's just, let's just remember something. Greg Valdez is, a, is an actual uh, police officer. He, he, he works in law enforcement right now. I don't know what his military past is, but he lives in northern New Mexico. He works as part of the establishment, the law enforcement establishment. So his story is not going to uh, benefit or fall on the side of somebody who has, uh, you know, who had evidence that was pointing towards the existence of alien beings. It's just never going to happen. So that's why, although I respect the man for the work he does, I really respect, I met his father in Dulce. I really had a lot, a lot of great respect for his father. I still do. As a matter of fact, I dedicated my book to his father. I just don't agree with Greg. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's too clean for me. Uh, with, especially with the people that I've met, the the people that I've interviewed in and around Dulce, um, just too many key characters uh, just point to the fact that Phil Schneider's death is highly questionable. Uh, the existence of a base is highly provable based on the information that was provided to me through this colonel. And, you know, I, it's strange that Norio Hayakawa, who I, I really respect, it's just all of a sudden doing a 180, no longer interested in the alien aspect. Uh, and Greg Valdez's book is, you know, it's, uh, it's just trying to wipe the slate clean, saying, oh, this never happened, you know, and what did happen, you know, uh, we can unsanitize what the mystery may have been, and, then, and when, in fact, it was just AFOSI from Kirtland, you know, pulling the smoke screen over Paul Benowitz's eyes and utilizing, you know, people like Paul, I forget his name, uh, to, uh, you know, to help, uh, you know, uh, fool people. So, I think his last name was more. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is that 79 is when the colonel gets involved because he's working over here in McClellan Air Force Base in Northern California near the state capital, Sacramento, as part of this uh, classified medical detachment, and they tell him, you need to fly out immediately to Edwards Air Force Base, which was used to be called Mar Army Air Force. At Murrah, he meets up with this, this, this small ad hoc group of individuals that they put together to tend to, to this place that none of them had ever heard of before called Dulce, Dulce, New Mexico. Uh, and this facility, this highly classified facility, they get there, uh, and that's where they see, uh, and they meet up with uh, uh, a representative of the New Mexico State Police, the Hickory uh, Apache uh, Police Department. And, of course, the military and the, the, the group DSD-3, which is in charge of overseeing everything at the Delta facility. And uh, that's where his story, you know, pretty much begins. He was briefed on the history and who was there, the, the beings, uh, from the time that he would, uh, left uh, Edwards Air Force Base and flew to uh, New Mexico. I believe they flew to Alamogordo and then headed up to... Uh, Northern New Mexico. When you interviewed the colonel, obviously he said he he wanted to remain anonymous for, for to right. protect himself and the family. He's also told you I, in the book, as I remember stating that he said once the book is published, he is going to uh, kind of disappear. Did he disappear? Did he stay? Did he have contact with you after the book was published? Just brief, just brief pieces of information here and there having to do with uh, Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, and this uh, one further piece of correlating evidence. Now, Nor uh, Norio Akawa, Jerry Pippin, Bill Ryan, Bill Ryan from uh, Project Camelot at the time, and uh, Mel Fabregas from Veritas Radio. We had this uh, all this information uh, that was presented, and we validated, we verified it. This guy was claiming that he was part of this group that worked with this other individual that had been killed, Mr. X, who was supposed to have spoken uh, and revealed everything about his job being an archivist for the federal government via a private contract um, through a general services agreement for, uh, with an aerospace firm in Southern California. 
Well, I got contacted by somebody who supposedly owed a favor to the colonel who said he worked at an aerospace firm in Southern California, and he gave me the information that I needed to validate who he was. He said what building he worked in, what floor he worked on, what he did on that floor, and he gave me the phone number to call to get into the actual area with a specific code. And I shared this with Jerry Pippen, Mel Fabregas, Bill Ryan, and it all checked out. I even went so far as to dig into this guy, and I found out that this guy's father was a former CIA uh, you know, um, operative, and uh, I even got the guy's FAA license, so it was a uh, you know, pilot license, and found out where he lives, everything. This was the proof to me that the colonel was indeed telling the truth about everything, that when he gave me this guy, uh, this guy validated uh, so much information, and essentially he was working at a, a tertiary facility. So the wright Patterson Air Force Base is everything that the government uh, has in storage uh, on film, video, tape, you name it, even on, even paper documentation between uh, the alien, any alien entities in the, in the military industrial complex, the military itself, and the U.S. federal government. It's all at wright Patterson Air Force Base. Well, that stuff needs to back up, be backed up. They have, a, they have a secondary and tertiary facilities, both um, – both aerospace firms were being paid like $2,000 an hour per, you know, archivist to do this. And their, their jobs last for like six months at a time, and then they're swapped out. Well, the guy, Mr. X, who had spoken with that whole group of people that I told you about, um, he ended up dead uh, within like just hours before he was supposed to speak at the uh, UFO crash retrieval conference in, in Nevada. And uh, he just had a baby, was just happily married. He looked, uh, you know, the, the spinning image of health, and, and he just ends up dead. He complains of a headache in the morning, by the evening he's gone. They have no explanation for what it was that took him out. Moscow flu, typical. Uh, silence the person that's going to speak and make it look like something natural. we got about 20-ish minutes left. I'm going to ask you this question that I was hoping we can get to the ETs themselves as well as their history and the history of Earth and us. Real quick, though, before I go there, the colonel, when you were interviewing, interview, interviewing him, gave you uh, an opportunity to look at actual photographs from Dulce, such yeah. as the uh, – cuneiform uh, uh, tablets and even the one of the gray weapons now you couldn't take notes but you studied them intently and you got home and you actually drew these and these are uh, images appear in your book right. i was hoping if you could just discuss real briefly some of the artifacts that you had a chance to look at in those pictures that that are in your book for right it was a little bit more involved than that because it was initial sketches from memory then undergoing memory regression, jotting down the details, giving them to a very, very talented uh, artist who then put together exactly what I can recall. Can you describe specifically that one gray weapon, uh, the plasma-type weapon that you had drawn for your book? Right. So that was the weapon in, in detail as described by the colonel and used by the colonel uh, that was actually a gray weapon, not a human weapon. Now, going back to it, the oh, by the way, the I, I should mention this: that John Rail, who is the owner of Open Minds, you know, there's a magazine called Open Minds. Yes. Um, John Rail actually paid some some Canadian uh, 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 engineering firm to replicate that weapon in, in its appearance. And uh, when I was invited to the Open Mind Studios for an interview with them, a video interview, um, I was shocked at the level of detail that they, they were able to recreate this weapon, life -si a life-size replica of the weapon. It was somewhere between thirty and $50,000 for it to be made. It was it just was insane. It was just uh, the level of quality. Well, it's definitely one of the major artifacts that people can appreciate in ufology. It goes a lot further than God bless his soul who's passed away, Jesse Marcel Jr., when uh -huh. he was regressed and, and drew the actual E.T. writing that he found on the, uh, on the, on the little 
what do they call the rods, the rods that he found that his right. father showed him in right. 1947. Right. Now, going going back to the extraterrestrials, let's go back about a million years to the progenitors, which mm-hmm. were the first uh, ET race that arrived here, uh, and and then uh, obviously the Austra Albus came from them, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. Let's back up to before they got to Earth, they came to Mars because their initial planet was destroyed, right? Well, they came to Mars because their physiological makeup was uh, more adept to um, uh, acclimating on Mars as opposed to on Earth, which uh, held the levels of uh, of uh, certain types of chemicals that were not, you know, uh, advantageous to their survival. So that's all described in detail in the book, by the way. I know, I know you read that part. Yes. So... Something catastrophic happened on Mars, and that drove them to Earth. And there's a whole timeline that's spelled out. And this is why this is the, the whole uh, – this is the catalyst uh, for the meeting. And this is the reason for the, the sharing or the knowledge exchange, the knowledge transfer. Um, all the information that correlates in the human origin section of my book, the transformation hypothesis, that was a blog. That was a blog that was online. That was a blog that was available at the company that I worked at. And the person who put me in touch with the, my source had shared that blog. And that Occurrence. blog, yes, and that blog correlated to everything that he had learned about on those, on those uh, Acadian cuneiform type tablets, those metallic tablets. Yes, so because he read the blog is why he reached out to you and said, you're dead on with this information, and right. that's why he agreed for the interview. Right. Now, let's go back. So about a million years is when they, the progenitors left Mars for Earth. 900,000 years. I know this timeline. I don't have it in front of me. But what happened then that ultimately led to the seclusion of those greys or the, the false promise that one set gave to the other well, to put that, them in that, Dulce? Well, that actually happened later. See, what happened was is that the the graves were essentially isolated to the other side of of the planet. Now, remember, we're talking about the Tigris and Euphrates River, which is the cradle of human civilization, the earliest known civilization. Uh, we're now finding that there were other civilizations, like in uh, Gebekli Tepe and in uh, Peru, from uh, the date back to about 12,500 years, but that's not something new. So the, the correlation of, well, what you're talking about is what happened about 25,000 years ago is when the descendants of the, Os- of the Oscar Elvis, who were the descendants of the Anu, the Anunnaki, the progenitors, uh, had been warned. They said that this group these EGG, it's funny that they're called EGG, which correlates to the Sumerian text, um, were going to be seen as demigods equally as powerful and capable, so you needed to elim- they needed to eliminate them. So they essentially uh, gave them a disease, put them on the other side of the planet, but they didn't figure upon them surviving and uh, living and subsisting off of the uh, local ecology of uh, the of the ecology that they had been thrust to on the other side of the planet, those being the dis- the, uh, the lower-level grays and the distant grays, who are the subsequent generations of cloned uh, individuals. Now, let's talk about let, – let's go back a bit. You said the progenitors were the Anunnaki, and they created the Austro Albus? Right. Now, there was a chart that I used to have on my website. I don't think it's up there any longer, but it actually showed – how at one point the descendants of the progenitors started to die off uh, here on Earth. And Earth was just not uh, working out for them for their physiological uh, makeup. So what they started to do was is they created this, uh, this pristine line, line, uh, bloodline of humans, human females to be exact. Um, they were typo RH negative, which is the universal – non-traceable, non, you know, a very ambiguous uh, bloodline that exists to this day. Even science to this day still cannot give an answer as to the origin of the typo RH-negative bloodline. 
So that bloodline is described in detail in the book by the Colonel to the League. Uh, findings which state that it emerged at a time when the the Anu, who were the descendants of the progenitors, needed to interbreed with a human bloodline to to essentially exist, you know, exist on the planet without dying off. So that pure the initial bloodline of females, um, it was the, they they began a breeding program. And then uh, ultimately, the Ostra Albus were the descendants of that, were the result of that breeding program. That is a very tightly controlled bloodline to this day. They don't, you know, it, it, you know, I go into detail as to how tightly controlled it is in the book. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into it too much because we don't have that much time left. But uh, that group represents, you know, essentially. Uh, the, the fraction of a percentage that runs the one percent who then enslaves the rest of us on this planet. The Illuminati, in essence, they, the royal bloodlines. That, 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 yeah, if that's what you want to call them. Yeah. I, I this is going to be off topic real quick, but this is actually a tweet from someone who was trying to buy your book. Uh, first name Dan, Twitter name at Mambo One Hundred and One. He says, "Tell." Uh, your guest, Mr. Sanchez, nothing happens when I try to buy the book on the website. Can, briefly, I know I was going to ask you this near the end. But do you mind telling people how they can acquire your book? I know you said UFO Highway. I I was able to buy it there uh, right. a long time ago. Uh, yeah, so. uh, yeah, UFOHighway.com. If he's having problems buying it, uh, tell him to use the Chrome browser. Uh, Chrome or um, Firefox, I, they all work. I've never had an issue with them. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, ufohighway.com, there's a little link to buy the book, and then you just select uh, if you're international or U.S. and just hit order now. I'm testing it right now, and it's working just fine. I just got there. And for anybody out there, just in case you order it and you don't receive it yet, just give it some time. I was starting to email, ask where it is, and, and sure enough, that week it showed up. So just give it some time <laughs> if you order. It will come. Uh, mine came, and uh, Mr. Sanchez yeah. uh, signed it. I, I thought that was really cool, too. So it, you'll get a signed copy if you order from his website. Uh, now, we do have under 10 minutes left, so let's go back to the, the grays again. Now, so they're put in Dulce by the, the ones, the, the Oster Albus that tell right. them essentially that they're a threat. They're, they're going to become demigods, that the humans are going to start worshiping them. So they want them to die off, and they basically promise them, go live in this cat in these caverns uh you'll be fine there and they were hoping they would die but instead they live just like you said with and they began to and essentially they began to thrive and and uh you know that's the the impetus of the whole book is the interaction between humans and these graves so now what happened that caused the split with the lower level grays and what's called the dissident grays, the ones that ended up working right. with our military. Very simple. The dissident grays uh, didn't buy into continuing to worship the group that essentially put them on the other side of the planet uh, to die off from a disease. They said, why are we worshiping <laughs> these descendants of these progenitors who want us dead? And for some unknown reason, the lower level grays have this, unbreakable affinity and, and, rever uh, and, and reverence for their makers. And they refuse to hate them uh, despite what they... So it's some sort of, some sort of forgiveness. And uh, it's kind of... But the dissonant grays, they don't accept that. And, that, and, and they, ended up, they ended up working more closely with uh, the humans there at Delphi for quite some time. And that's exactly what I was just about to say. Those... The dissident grays, the ones at the, the, the higher levels, essentially worked with the United States military, and at some point they even fought their uh, former uh, bloodline essentially by fighting with, with the U.S. on the side of the U.S. military against the lower level grays. Right. Now, let's give the breakdown for those people who are a little bit not, not too familiar with Dulce. There are several levels, and, and the bottom levels are restricted from human access, period. Can you describe the, the number of levels and what's on each level briefly? Well, there's really three levels that the humans operate on. You know, there's a top level where it's sort of like the uh, – uh, kind of like a mini Pentagon where the DS-3 operates, overseeing everything, and you have all the branches of the military that are interacting with the, with the contractors. Um, the second level – there's actually uh, where a lot of the work done by the contractors 
occurs uh, in addition to the fact that there's a uh, a hub there, a hub that has these maglev uh, tunnels that connect to other military facilities uh, all across the southwest and extending out all the way to the Ozarks. So, and then the third level uh, is where again we're a, we're more of it's more of like a a, a transfer area, uh, like a transfer of goods, transfer of uh, uh, you know. Personnel. Exchange, yeah, yeah. Exchange uh, occurs. There's a lot of work that's being done there as well. And then there's two auxiliary facilities. Uh, the, the one is a security facility out towards Lumberton uh, off, off the eastern slope, and the other one is uh, out near where the Project Gas Buggy uh, uh, historical site is. There's a water abatement there that is known to be the runoff for this uh, scientific auxiliary that uh, it has like, you know, chemical runoff and it's pretty controversial. Now, on the bottom level with the lower level grades, uh, most people know Dulce as the place, not just as the joint U.S. ET base, but also by the exclusive ETs living on the bottom that are doing these horrific experiments on humans. Can you describe the experiments as a little bit, as much detail as you can in the couple of minutes we have? Right. So a lot of the experiments that are happening down there have to do with super soldier type experiments where they're abducting uh, young people, you know, uh, boys, they're abducting young boys, abducting, you know, women of childbearing age. And what they're doing is they're, uh, you know, uh, trying to create like these super soldiers, these ultimate weapons, these, uh, you know, artificially uh, augmented uh, beings that are, you know, designed to do one thing and one thing only, which is to kill. And that was, um, you know, uh, that's one of the most controversial aspects of Delphi is that, you know, it's one of the reasons why the colonel came forth. It's one of the reasons why in 2009, when they had the Delphi conference right there in Delphi, New Mexico, many of the uh, UFO experts who were there to uh, discuss the facility uh, outright said that if this is what is happening, then it's, uh, it's a human rights violation. And it needs to stop. You know, what gives the military industrial complex, uh, let alone these beings, the right to take these people and perform this, these uh, types of experiments upon them? I mean, there, I mean, look, one of the experiments went haywire and a bunch of people got killed. Over 20, over 20 uh, lab technicians and scientists were killed by two people uh, that were experiments who broke loose. Uh, they were part of this. Uh, they were there was something called the MMC, which is the maximum. Uh, uh, the MCC, which is the Maximum Containment Center, which is uh, the real, you know, the scary level, and they broke free, and they killed a bunch of people, and that shut down the whole facility for a long time. It stopped development at the facility. Uh, this is well, this was well known. It's documented. It's on the internet, and the panel talks about it at length in the book. That is something we definitely have to fear. The fact that we have a faction of our humans that think they know what's best for us by not telling us certain things and and sending us the wrong way by disinformation and worse they think they're better than us because they're entitled to information that we're not and then when you when you go with what you said which i think totally makes sense that these are the bloodlines the royal bloodlines mm -hmm. that they seem to to want to stay amongst each other that they've been passing down the secrets and obviously they've always thought they were above us, and that's what continues to keep them there. And they're right. the, the Bilderbergers or whatever you want to call them. They're the 1% that call the shots for everybody. You know, the one good thing is that uh, my book was actually bought by a company that's turning it into a feature film. Uh, this is a big, big group. Um, I met with them in Hollywood. This is the reason why I was on with Sean Stone and his Buzzsaw television show, Sean being the son of Oliver Stone, the yes. famous director. So they're turning UFO Highway into a movie. I don't know if I can call it, but the story is going to be told worldwide, and that is important. And Sean Stone is an amazing person. I've, he hasn't appeared on this show yet for, yeah. for Dark Matter, but I've interviewed him a couple times in the past, and he will come on. Yeah, he, he is, and he's down to earth. i got to give the guy credit, and I'm yeah. excited to see his work. we got about three minutes left, so I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, then I want to go into what's new for you. Mm -hmm. One thing that I read in your book, I knew about, uh, of course, Area 51. I knew a little bit about Dulce. Thankfully, your book filled in all the missing dots for me and, and so much more. 
I heard about Kapustin Yar in Russia as their secret Area 51, but Chengdu, that I've always assumed China would have something, and you actually wrote about it. I, specifically, I actually found it in the glossary in your book. Can right. you describe uh, really briefly about Chengdu? Well, it's a massive underground complex, and it's very controversial because I did some work on something called Leonid. Uh, it stand, it's an acronym that stands for Low Earth Orbit Interceptor uh, Defense, and it is, it's our nanosatellite interceptor defense. And there's a, a public uh, face for this called Leonidas, which is where the money funnels in for this black project. And it has a lot to do with that facility in, in the Chengdu district. Um, we don't have enough time to talk about it. But there's a massive underground facility there. It's very controversial. Linda Wolfen Hill's website, which is earthfiles.net, has a huge expose on this. I provided Linda with the congressional budgetary documentation proving the existence of this project, what it's for, and there are reverse alien, well, there's alien technological components to the entire system. Well, this has been an awesome interview. I definitely have to have you back. We just touched, barely touched the surface. I hope everybody out there uh, dives into this book as much as I did, UFO Highway. And I'm going to ask you, the, the, exactly, UFO, the name of the book, UFO Highway, the website, ufohighway.com. Uh, I'm going to give you this opportunity to tell the listeners what's new for you, what's, where you're going to be speaking next, how they can find you, and uh, one final message to everybody out there. Right. So uh, the new thing for me is, uh, besides my UFO research, is I have a, a, a company that does paranormal software called GhostHunterApps.com. And I have over 20 years in Silicon Valley as a senior level software engineer. I put all of that experience into these ghost hunting apps using real math, real science, and real technology, none of the fake stuff. Um, don't have any open dates for 2015 just yet. I'm, I have a bunch of... Uh, invitations but i've not been i've not accepted any of them yet so that information will be posted in the news and link section of ufohighway.com where i'll be speaking uh on ufos and the paranormal everybody check out ufohighway.com and read the book ufo highway it will blow your socks off mr sanchez it has truly been an awesome interview everybody have a happy holiday and make sure you join us next week to speak on another one of my favorite topics, which we spoke about with Kathleen Martin last week, alien abduction. I am featuring someone who has conscious memory recall of their experience. With that being said, this is Dr. J signing out.